Good evening, and welcome to the Prince Hall Think Tank, a monthly conversation amongst Prince Hall Freemasons where we discuss topics relative to craft masonry. My name is Brother Antonio Caffey, and I'm a very proud past master of St. Mark's Lodge Number 7, located in Columbus, Ohio, where Worship Brother Shimon Stone serves as Worship Master. The lodge was chartered in 1852 by the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio, where currently the Honorable Kelvin J. Davis serves as Most Worshipful Grand Master. Before I let the other brothers introduce themselves, I would like to state that the views and opinions that are expressed by us tonight in no way reflect the views and opinions of the Grand Lodges and Lodges in which we hold membership in. Also, if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to post them on our Facebook page or by using the chat option on YouTube. And if we have time at the end of the conversation, we'll try and answer some of those questions. Speaking of YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page so that you can stay up to date with everything that the Think Tank is doing. At this time, I'll let our regular panelists introduce themselves, and afterwards, our two very special guests can introduce themselves. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be back here in the Prince Hall Think Tank. My name is James R. Morgan III. I am a proud past master of Corinthian Lodge Number 18 uh, here in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C., and I have the honor and distinction of serving as the Worshipful Associate Grand Historian and Archivist for the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia, where the Honorable Philip David is presiding over Prince Hall Masons here in Washington, D.C. I wanna say, uh, before I pass the mic, that I am also a resident of Hydesville, Maryland, where <laughs> the Honorable Emmanuel Stanley is Grand Master of Prince Hall Masons in the state of Maryland. Uh, I, I wear many hats, and uh, beyond that, I am also a proud, proud, proud native of the great garden state of New Jersey. And so with that being said, since I wear so many hats, Grandmaster Dawood, I want you to see that I'm wearing my North Eagles uh, Negro <laughs> Leagues hat. There you go. Because Grandmaster Dawood is the Grandmaster of my home state, the state where I spent the first 18 years of my life, New Jersey. So I'm very happy to be here on the Prince Hall Think Tank this evening. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to pass the mic over to Grandmaster Emmanuel Stanley and then to Grandmaster Dawood. Well, good, every, good evening to everyone in your audience. Uh, I am Emmanuel Stanley, the 26th Most Worshipful Grand Master of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Maryland. And let me tell you, I was so honored to receive the invitation to be on the Think Tank. Uh, so I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm happy to be here. I'm ready to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and I'm looking forward to dialoguing with my good friend from the great state of New Jersey, Most Worshipful Grand Master Dawood. So thank you again. Don't you, Grandmaster Dawood? Good evening. My name is Brother Tyson Rasul Dawood. Tyler from the 2179 out of Newark, New Jersey. Also, I am the most social Grandmaster of most social football Grand Lodge of New Jersey. It's a pleasure to be here this evening amongst these distinguished brothers. It's certainly to share a call with Brother Stanley, who I admire so much. I'm so excited and I love the things that he's doing there in the great. Uh, thank you too, brother. So tonight, again, our topic is part two in our series of young leaders. In this series, we profile our leaders of the craft and we try to glean from them any wisdom that they may have to impart and discuss ways in which our younger members of the craft can start preparing themselves to assume um, the various leadership positions within Freemasonry. So we're just going to um, we have some questions that we're going to ask tonight. And as always, please feel free to post again your questions on either our YouTube page or our um, our Facebook page so that at the end of the, our question and answer period, we can ask some of your questions as well. So uh, without further ado, we'll jump right into it. First question. What challenges do you face? Uh, being relatively young and in a leadership position, um, the leadership position that you're in right now. Now let's start out with Brother Stanley. I can start, you know, one of the primary challenge that I face is number one, the disbelief that someone under the age of 50 is the Grand Master uh, of the Grand Lodge of Maryland. Uh, for the past 55 years, we've had leaders who have been 
over the age of 60 leading the craft. Um, so it's a little bit challenging right now, both internally and externally to be taken seriously, but it's slowly coming around for me. Um, so that's that's been my greatest challenge so far. Gundawa, what about you? I really have to piggyback of uh, what Brother Stanley said. Uh, fortunately, within the last few years, I'm not the first young grandmaster. We do have a past grandmaster. Uh, a junior past grandmaster who came out at, at age 43. Hmm. However, we still did have our challenges, especially when it comes to moving the jurisdiction forward into the 21st since, uh, century. We may see a lot of things that we do are based off of things that we did 20, 30 years ago because we've always done it that way. So when we bring something new and innovative, we get some resistance. Fortunately, we're Grandmaster, and that helps out, and that's been listed a lot of these programs. Wonderful. Uh, how do you think that your that your youth uh, and your and your in your approach to governing the craft, how is it or how are you hoping that it affects your jurisdiction? What what kind of impact are you are you brothers hoping to have uh, while you're serving in this position? Uh, Grandma Stanley? Wow. The impact that I'm hoping to have is that we we can be fraternal but also take care of business. Um, and also to open uh, have a true dialogue to the grandmaster. We we seem to uh, have excluded the membership from having a true open door policy uh, and being able to speak with their grandmaster. So the grandmaster is almost this mythical figure. Uh, so I'm trying to be a Mason's Mason here in the state of Maryland, someone that you can talk to, but also this, you know, it's about business. You know, our ritual is there for a reason, but there's a, a financial side to this organization, which we must address. There's uh, properties that we own, uh, not only our Grand Lodge building, but um, lodges around the state, which have some physical issues. So, you know, we're taking care of business over here and that's what I'm trying to achieve as Grandmaster. Grandmaster Dawood? Well, I, I want to use Grandmaster Stanley actually as a as an example. I remember one time I saw a Facebook post that he put up you know, for all the pub, all the public to see. He he put his cell phone number up on Facebook, letting his jurisdiction know that he has an open door policy. That's extremely important. Even while we do have people that represent us in different areas, and maybe more deputies. Other people and the second Muslim grandmaster is all theory that I'm sorry, Grandmaster Noah, can you um maybe move close to your microphone a little bit? You're you're fading out just a little bit. Hmm, that's not good. Okay, is it a little better? Yeah, it's a little bit better. Okay. Um, the second uh, Muslim Grand Master, the Prince of Freemason, I find that to be very important towards the uh, powers of religion, other religion. Uh, I think personally, a lot of people, I get calls about it all the time from uh, people all across the country. And it's helping move us forward. Hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. So, <clears throat> what what's been your I guess your interaction with your older past grandmasters? Like, what what I guess what have you 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 gleaned from them, and, and what's been the the um, you know the the nature of the relationship? So you know, so to speak. I'm gonna start with. Uh, Grandmaster Dole. I'm very, very fortunate. I have a very good relationship with my past grandmasters. We have a lot of them here in New Jersey because we serve two years terms and well over, we have not gone over that in well over 100 years. So there's quite a few of them. I believe uh, we're at about 12 now. When I go to them, I pitch ideas immediately after I was installed. I called the meeting with the Grand Cabinet and the past Grand Masters. And we broke bread and I went over my entire program. 
I got a lot of buy-in by doing that. And some very good ideas from them. I'm smart enough to know you need to get different perspectives from so many different people, especially if they are from other generations. So it's it's fine in New Jersey. Hmm. And that's not a political answer, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> good though. Hey, uh, uh, Grandma Stanley, you're muted. Uh, you, you see, you see the uh, microphone button on your screen. You see a microphone button. I think we uh, we muted you by mistake. Can you hear me? Fault. Let's see here, brother, brother Kathy, Can you um get him unmuted? I don't think I have that gonna, capability. Let me see. Let's see. One, one moment, Grandma Stanley. We apologize for that. It, it unmuted a little bit, Dennis. Okay. Yeah, there, yeah, there we go. Grandma Stanley, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, outstanding. Uh, I was saying that sounded like a political answer to me, uh, Grandma Stanley, but I think <laughs> that answer. <laughs> you know, uh, the relationship here in Maryland is, is pretty good with the past Grand Masters. Um, I had the opportunity when I was Deputy Grand Master to go around the state and to present uh, my plan of action uh, coming into this office, uh, although they did not participate in it, I know they got the word uh, about what was, what was being said and what was being presented. Uh, and thus far, I've been well received. Um, I get calls uh, from at least one of them on a biweekly basis, uh, and the others are just there to support me. Wh whatever we've had, whatever we've done, they have been there. So I'm just appreciative of that. So in my mind, there are no issues here in the state of Maryland that I'm aware of with the with the past Grand Masters. We have a great relationship. Well, Grand Masters, uh, I'm going to tell you both uh, publicly, and I've said it before in private, uh, both of you are, are, are people who I uh, am proud to say I look up to uh, in my Masonic walk. And I know you have a lot of wisdom to share with younger brothers. Uh, what advice uh, do you have for young up and coming uh, leaders uh, who may want to take a leadership position one day within the Prince Hall affiliated uh, Masonic family and just don't know how to get started. What what, what advice would you give them? Uh, Grandmaster Stanley, you can uh, go ahead and kick it off. Don't know how to get started. The first thing they can do is to volunteer to be on whatever committees are available within their local lodge. Mm. You know, you have to get started. You can't jump straight to worship master. Right. You need to learn the inner workings of your lodge. You need to learn the different personalities. Uh, and the family members of the members of your lodge so that mm. you can, when it's time for you to lead, you will have an understanding of who's there. You will have developed the relationships necessary to be the leader that your lodge requires. Mm. That's my recommendation, that you jump in and get involved. Mm. Get involved and listen more than you speak. Mm. I, agree, I agree with Brother Stanley wholeheartedly. That's one, way, one thing that helped me progress within the fraternity, but I was at every funeral. I made sure I joined several different committees. I asked a lot of questions. And also, I would bring new ideas to the table. Now, a lot of new brothers, they get discouraged because sometimes they bring a few things to the table and then the lodge doesn't do them. But you keep bringing them. You readdress them to the lodge with different ideas and volunteer to chair them, uh, put together your own committee of people who believe in it and it just be patient. Patient is very, very important. Uh, and then after a while, your lodge members will see your work and you, you will progress within the fraternity. So I, I remember when I was a worship master and I'd always said, you know, if, if you were, if you did the job right, it was almost like having a second 40 hour a week job. You know, now that's as a worshipful master, as a grand master. Uh oh, you muted. Oh, sorry about that. I, I, I would assume being a grand master double that. So, how do you all find um, ways to balance? You know, your 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 work, your family life, and then basically being a conservator of masonry within um, your, your particular jurisdiction. Oh, hold on, sorry. Now, hold on. I'll start. I'll hold on, start. Brother Stanley. Yeah, go I'll start. Go ahead. 
Well, one of the things that I utilize in his great being a grandmaster in, in the year 2018 is technology. Technology helps out tremendously. Uh, I put a lot of stuff out on social media. I utilize that. I find different things. Flyers don't work like they used to. Um, also, text messaging, email, where you can email five, 600 people at one time for something that you have or a committee that you're putting putting together. That helps. There's no doubt about it that grandmasters don't sleep a lot. <laughs> uh, a lot of us get up in the wee hours of the morning, three, four, five, at least the latest five o'clock in the morning, especially if we have our usual vocation. Uh, and you, you have to learn how to balance everything. Number two, I use the calendar on my phone, and that may sound you know pretty elementary, but Quite honestly, I wake up every day. I look to see what's going on. I either look at it on my laptop or my phone. I organize my day. I do that at the beginning of the day, and it helps me balance everything out. Last but certainly not least, my family is on board. Uh, I have a very supportive wife, uh, and, and she's there for me. And she knows things that I need a lot of help with, and she helps me out. So that, that's how I, I get to balance everything out. Master Stanley, you're you're, uh, you're muted. Let's see here. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Obviously, I got to learn how to utilize this technology, uh, <laughs> Grandmaster Dawood. I'm not as good as you. <laughs> this is my first time doing this, so. <laughs> Look, I, I'll be honest with you. I have not yet mastered this uh, this balance between work, uh, Grand Lodge, and family. I, I'm still struggling with it. Uh, most weekends, I have a minimum of six activities that I'm expected to be at. Um, and the fact that I am new into the office, everybody is pulling on me to be at their event. And I am the crazy grandmaster that I'm trying to do it. So I may spend two hours at your activity, two hours at the next one, and two hours at the next one. And in between that, I'm trying to call home uh, to find out what's going on. Now, I don't know who's listening on here and I don't know who developed these questions, but during my work day, I've got more things about masonry on my work computer than anything else. Uh, so I'm doing about 80 hours easily uh, for my Grand Lodge, if not more. And I'm probably doing about 20 hours for my, for my actual office. Uh, fortunately, I, I have a lot of flexibility there, so I'm blessed in that regard, but uh, I'm still trying to master it. I'm, I'm using all the, the technology that um, Grandmaster Dawu uh, expressed, uh, but it's a challenge. I mean, it is it is difficult. It is difficult. I'm, I'm taking all kinds of uh, vitamins and drinking, trying to get as much water in me as possible. Uh, and rest is a thing of uh, of the past. So three years from now, maybe I'll be able to sleep a full night. But it's difficult, so it's it's challenging. Uh, I don't have a good answer for you for that, and I couldn't advise anybody else. Uh, I see. I need to give you a call more often, bro, uh, brother Dawu. Please <laughs> give, me, give me give me some help. Give me give me some tips. Hey, but I've bought more flowers and more dinners over the last ninety days. <laughs> so, no I've had more. I'm sorry, so I forgot. <laughs> In my whole in my whole time in my relationship, so it's a challenge. But I love what I do, and my wife is very supportive. My family's very supportive. Uh, Grandmaster uh, Stanley, uh, to go back to your comment about uh, having a lot of Masonic materials on your work computer and whatnot, uh, I want to reiterate that the views and opinions of those on the Prince Hall think tank. No, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, oh, well, hold on, Brother James, before you ask the next question, I, I think one one important thing to, to, to we should point out that both grandmasters said that I think um, I think a lot of brothers take for granted that when you assume these leadership positions, if you are married and you have a family, you have to prepare them for that as right. well. Because while you know you're you're out there, you're on the road, you know going visiting doing different things you have someone back at home mm -hmm. and 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 in order for you to, to free you up to think about what you need to concentrate on and all of that they have to be in tune with that too and that just can't step 
start with, okay, hey, I'm going to be grandmaster, you know, next year, so right. get yourself ready. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a way that you need to prepare your family and your family life in order to support you. So, yeah, I think that was a good point that y'all raised. Right. Absolutely. Uh, to change to change gears just just a little bit, um, and I know this is going to be a very very big question, but what do you feel are the most important decisions that you have to make as grandmasters of your respective uh, jurisdictions? Mm. Mm. Well, you want me to start? Go, go right ahead, sir. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, anything dealing with discipline. Uh -huh. Uh, it's challenging. I mean, we've had uh, one expulsion uh, since I've taken office. We've had several suspensions. So it's difficult to uh, to levy the Masonic life of one of your brothers and, and how he will be able to proceed going forward. So that's difficult. Um, and anything financial uh, has been challenging for me. And also a true evaluation of another brother's work in the craft. Tenure often um, allows a brother to stay in office for, for quite some time. Uh, and we, we try to keep them around because we like them. It's, it's a personality, uh, popularity contest, so to speak, opposed to what are you actually producing and, and can help the craft move forward. So I've had to make some difficult changes in a variety of officers. But it's what I had to do to make sure that we move forward in a positive direction. Um, we we make we honor those brothers that have served with emeritus status or some other recognition, but uh, sometimes it's good to bring in new blood and allow new ideas uh, to help carry the organization to where it needs to be. I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Grandmaster Dawood. Right. It, it is amazing how our answers resemble. It's like a mm -hmm. parrot <laughs> of each other. Mm -hmm. Because discipline undoubtedly has been the toughest, you know, with the suspensions. Because a lot of times you're suspending a friend, a mm. somebody you may hang out with, you've helped them, and they've helped you. And it's not an easy thing to do, but a necessary thing to do. Because you have to be grandmaster, and everyone will only respect you if you do the job of a grandmaster and not do anything that has to do with favoritism right. of the such. And uh, as far as positions, sometimes you put someone new in a position who isn't as experienced and may not be the best for the position, but they're the future of that position. Because you have to think down the line. It's very important to me that my jurisdiction continues to grow for years after I'm out of the seat. So I do some appointments thinking about five years or uh, 10 years from now. Yeah. You know, something that I think that that's a very important thing that you just said, Grandmaster Dawood, with regards to um, investing in the future. And, and Grandmaster Stan, I think you, you, you know, you echoed that as well. Um, because what ha what has happened is there are a lot of brothers who, who I've come in contact with personally who they who feel as though they get overlooked or what have you. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier about being patient and, and being in the proper position, if you will, so that when the opportunity does arrive, that perhaps that grandmaster or whoever, and even on your, your job or whatever, someone will recognize your talent, but you have to be uh, uh, present. You know, I used to tell, tell brothers in my lodge all the time, I said half the battle is being present. But if you're not even there for the opportunity, when the opportunity knocks, right. you won't miss it. Yes, sir. Uh, Grandmaster Caffey. Oh, excuse me. Ooh, I, I was, I was, I'm, a, I'm prophesying. I'm prophesying. That's right. That's right. <laughs> See, now, brother, I'm going to receive a phone call probably tomorrow. Um, oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> we got but, your back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, good brother. So uh, what what characteristics? Okay, so you know, you have the obviously you have the office of grandmaster and uh the, the things that you know um go with that. But when we talk about leaders of the lodge, the worshipful master, what skills and characteristics do you believe every worshipful master should should uh possess? Is that for me or I'll take it. I'll take it first. 
Well, it is necessary that a worship master understands that his, in his positions, he services the brother. He's at the beck and call. It could, it could encompass getting a call in the middle of the night and addressing it because of somebody may have passed or hurrying up and going to someone's house after an accident has happened. Also, it's really, really important that you listen and can, he, he can understand that he can agree to disagree with people in the lives. That's very, very important, those factors. Very, very important. I would say, I would say that um, anyone in a leadership position, be it worship master or, or any other capacity, uh, he has to have courage. Uh, if you have a clear idea of what your plan is and what your idea is for whatever organization that you're leading, you have to have the courage to carry it through to fruition. That means you have to make tough decisions. Uh, and often that means unpopular decisions. That means that you have taking the time to evaluate your organization. Uh, we call it a top-down assessment. You know, what works, you keep in place. What doesn't work, you start making the necessary adjustments to fix it because you can't do, keep doing what you've been doing and expecting a different outcome. That's been my motto as Grandmaster. You know, let's not practice insanity. Let's practice masonry. We are builders, we are thinkers. Uh, we represent an organization that is built upon uh, men who are mathematicians and scientists and great men. And great men don't continue to repeat practices that are uh, non-productive. <laughs> you know, and that's the only way we can grow and make sure that this organization lasts beyond us. If we're able to have the courage that is necessary, if we stand upon the shoulders of great men. And we are only here because they made the tough decisions uh, that allowed us to continue to practice masonry. It could not have been easy in the 1700s for a man named Prince Hall to be made uh, a mason and to survive in Boston uh, with the with the possibility of being uh, abducted and shipped down south uh, and placed in slavery. It could not have been easy for him to be lobbying. Uh, the city of Boston for on behalf of, of black children uh, to improve the school systems. And we have to have that courage, that same courage today as worshipful masters, as grand masters, as, as uh, commanders in chief or whatever your position is, you must have courage. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. I could, I, you know, could, couldn't have, could not have said that one uh, better myself. Um, ne next up, uh, and this, again, Another another big question. Uh, what is it that you both believe to be the greatest challenges facing Freemasonry in, in your jurisdictions in particular uh, today? What what are the greatest challenges that you hope to maybe uh, help your jurisdictions overcome uh, while, while you're Grandmaster? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm gonna ask Grandmaster Dawood to go. And okay. I, I wanna I, he's been Grandmaster longer than me, so I believe. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Well, one thing that I've, I've really noticed, and actually I heard another grandmaster, I can't remember which one, bringing up last year at the Cops of Grandmasters is the disconnect with our millennials. Uh, and don't take that, uh, Brother Morgan. <laughs> you, you know I hate that word. You know I hate that word. <laughs> but but, but it, it really, it, it's so true. If you look at the, the crew of uh, brothers that we have that are 35 years and younger, we, we just don't have enough. We really don't. And it's a missed generation at this time. And millennials are very, very bright. Very well. I'm, I'm a teacher by trade. So I've taught a lot of millennials. They are, they are much, much smarter than we are. Mm -hmm. They just communicate differently. They interact differently and the way that we do a lot of things even socially does not interest them overall so what i've done i established a millennial committee that reports directly to the grand cabinet and they've given us some incredible ideas and next month no in may they're going to have 
their own social that we're helping to fund in which they will all get together and meet each other all across the states as brothers and sisters. So I'm very excited about that. But really, if you go into a meeting, just do a test. Ask everyone who's 35 years old and younger to stand. And it's scary. We can't miss an entire generation. Right. We will die. That, 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 that definitely hits home for me as a 28 year old. <laughs> definitely hits home for me. I, and, and Grandmaster, will please keep me posted on that progress because I'd, I'd love to hear about that, especially since it's my home state. Oh, great. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Grandmaster Stanley? I don't know how to follow up from that. Uh, you, you actually uh, reminded me of what took place at last, last year's conference uh, and gave me some ideas for, for my jurisdiction. So thank you. Uh, this is this has been most helpful. I owe you guys some money. <laughs> I'm a phone call away, brother Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I couldn't pay for this this sort of uh, uh, wisdom. What I see is one of the the greatest challenges uh, for Freemasonry, and, and in particular Prince Hall Freemasonry, is the fact that we have become comfortable and complacent. There's a list that circulates the internet of all the great men that have come before us. And I've asked my jurisdiction, well, how many of those men are still living? And what are we going to do about it to add to that list? There should be a whole group of people uh, that are currently living that should be men of prominence that the general public can look at and say, I want to be like that brother. There, there's nothing wrong with looking at a Benjamin Banneker who, who was a great man, but a hundred years, can he relate to those millennials, which uh, Brother Dawood was was talking about. Uh, but a Shaquille O'Neal, that's something that brothers can look to. But I was utilizing in Massachusetts the celebrity of a Shaquille O'Neal to improve the image and to raise the profile of Prince Hall Masonry uh, throughout this country and throughout this, uh, this world. So I would say it's complacency. We become stagnant. Uh, we're often resistant to change. I still have lodges in my jurisdiction that they say, hey, I don't have a, uh, members in my jurisdiction say I don't have a cell phone. I have members that say I don't use a computer. Uh, or I have those members that say they don't use a computer, but they got a smartphone. And then I have to educate them to the fact that you walking around with a computer and then I have to begin to show them how to use it <laughs> and how powerful the tool is. Uh, so that's what I see. We, we're just complacent. We're reluctant to change. We have some called landmarks and we, and, and some brothers feel that there's no flexibility there. That, you know, we'll die if we don't realize that the world is changing and we have to find a way to change with it and to make masonry work with it. You know, it doesn't change the ritual. It doesn't change our, any of our moral principles if we change the way we do business. So it's just that, that resistance to change and complacency. Um, and a desire for older members and younger members to try to, to reach a common ground. Uh, coming into a leadership position, I'm running full throttle. I realized early on, hey, I better slow down because there's some people that are crawling. Um, and there's a lot of millennials around me. I, I, I don't know how to, what's a better word to use, Brother Morgan, <laughs> them, them millennials? You know what? I, I'm going to figure that one out and get back to you on it. I appreciate that. Like the only reason why I hate that word is because I'm on, you know, I'm young, but I'm almost thirty. So when they put when they group me in with someone who's like nineteen, now I'm like, I, I don't know if that's the same. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's the same. And I, re I remember uh, when Clinton was president. That 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 should mean something. <laughs> when Clinton was president, man. Okay. <laughs> the next generation is Generation X, and they're coming, brother Morgan. So right. I mean, right behind. They, you know, millennials about the age out of those teens. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But I have to agree with you, uh, Grandmaster Dawood. Uh, these young brothers and young sisters uh, that are coming into the order of the Eastern Stars are so much smarter than we are, and they operate so much faster. Uh, there are times where we need for them to slow down because everything is not uh, microwavable. Uh, but they they do think outside the box. They have a different way of of, of achieving the same goals that we're looking for. Uh, oftentimes, we just need to slow down and listen. Um, I like to tell younger brothers and younger sisters to to listen more than they talk. But I also need to practice that same philosophy, so we can all gain wisdom and move forward. 
I know I, I often uh, tell brothers that like if, if you go back in time, I'm sure you'll find at one point in time within a lodge, you'll find a time period when brothers argued about switching over from using a printing press to a typewriter. Right. Like that, that that was the biggest argument. Like, you know, why why using that fancy new equipment, that typewriter where this printing press right here worked for right, us right. for years. And why you so this is something I think that, that Freemasonry and any any old older or historic organization has, has has been dealing with for years. And I think the um somehow either we do one or two things, either we ignore it and we wait for those older generation brothers to die off and then we implement stuff which really isn't a good thing because we lose that wisdom or we, we find ways like you brothers are doing to really bridge that gap you know we we, we don't want to forget what we used to do but there are ways and things that we need to do to change in order for us to keep on going like we haven't it, it's almost impossible for an organization to be around for this long and be stagnant you know, right. so there, there's some time for where, where we we have accepted that change and we've moved on. And it's it's like, can we just harness that and do it quicker? I guess with, with the new generation, you know, they want things done quicker. We just right. need to find better ways to do it. So, again, I applaud you, brothers, um, for doing that. Uh, I think that's that's a great idea. Just getting those that that age group together and and, you know, um, I hope that spreads. Uh, I hope you can talk to some of your other fellow grand masters and get that implemented. I love that idea. Uh, speaking of like, so that, so, okay, we talk different questions. I'm brand new into the craft. You know, I just, just got raised and I'm, I'm, I'm about to be appointed to my, my first position um, within the lodge. What advice would you give someone that's just about to, you know, be appointed and, and they have desires one day to assume the East, uh, Brother Stanley. I would say um, take the opportunity to evaluate what was done by your predecessors. If there's any sort of documentation, previous reports, uh, or if those previous chairpersons are available, have a conversation with them. You don't have to follow everything they did, but it's a good idea to find out from them what took place prior to you joining the committee or taking a chairmanship. There may be some historical knowledge that will be of great value to you, and you won't repeat mistakes of those members or, the, or those previous chairpersons. They can, they should be able to advise you uh, the pitfalls that they, that they came across or some of the great ideas that they had. And perhaps either they implemented them or never had the opportunity to implement. So that's what I would say. Just take the time before you jump out there and say, hey, I'm Superman. I know everything. You know, well, back up. Slow down just a little bit, just a tad bit. And gain some wisdom first. Hey, Gather uh, some intel. Grandmaster Dawood, excuse me. Uh, Grandmaster Stanley, in response to that, I want to share something really quickly. It doesn't have anything to do with nothing almost. But uh, I was appointed to a new position um, in my Grand Lodge uh, as, a ch as a chairman of a committee. And uh, the previous chairman gave me all his hard copy uh, files, right? And so what I did was I made sure to sit down and go through all of them step by step by step and, and educate myself. And um, it took me about three days. And so when I, I, I finally got in touch with him after I read everything, he said, oh, I'm surprised that, uh, that, that, it, only that it took you three days. I, I thought you'd have had all that stuff read for, for uh, the day after. Uh, <laughs> I, I told him, I said, well, the only reason I stopped was because um, Star Wars, uh, the, the, the Last Jedi had come out. So I had to go to the, go to the movie to watch it twice. <laughs> and, and the person I'm talking about, by the way, is uh, uh, Most Worshipful Past Grand Master Warren Whitley, uh, oh, who I think both of you know. My hero. <laughs> my hero. Yeah. The legend. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that didn't have nothing to do with nothing. I just wanted to share that since he said, since, uh, Grand Master Neely said that. Uh, Grand Master, I will go ahead. Well, when you go into any position, strive to be the best person that has ever done that position before. Mm -hmm. And then, like Brother Stanley said, look at what others do. You know, take the good, push away the bad. And, and just, it's back to basics, really, is work, work very, very hard at it. Two, start to learn the position ahead of you. 
so that when it's time for people to move up, you're ready. Or if that person is not there for the evening, you will sit inside, you may, may ask, can I sit in that chair? And then people will sit in that chair and they can envision you being in that position one day. Uh, I, I never forget when I went to Junior Warden in my life, and I had some opposition. Yes, the city grandmaster had opposition for Junior Warden in his life. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of the best things that could have happened to me. It really made me a much better Junior Warden. I said, you know what? I'm going to show them I'm going to be the best Junior Warden this lodge has ever had. And that was the way I worked and took you know, all of my responsibilities during, during that term. And I take I took that on to see what worship master, grand lodge positions, and now even as grand master, I strive, I strive to be that. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we have one more question before we go to uh, our audience questions. And this is this is one that I uh, wanted to make sure that I asked you both. Um, we deal a lot with, with, with Masonic history here on the Prince Hall Think Tank. And oftentimes what happens is those who have been elected, such as yourselves, to be grand masters and grand secretaries and whatnot, those are the ones who we kind of remember because those are the ones who leave a paper trail. But And sometimes we forget about those who helped them along the way. So with that being said, I, I know this is gonna be a hard question, but what individual or individual brothers um, inspired you both the most uh, in your Masonic journey, be it a relative, uh, a brother from your lodge or, or what have you? Uh, who was somebody that inspired you to wanna to strive to, to get to where you are today in, in, in Freemasonry? Uh, Grandmaster Stanley? Oh, sure, I mean, that's, that's a lot of brothers, uh, but I'll say the the initial brother was my first worshipful master, uh, worshipful master Cleveland Haynes of Roscoe C. Cartwright Lodge Number One Twenty Nine. Uh, fun and very personable outside of the lodge, uh, but in the lodge he was strictly business, uh, proficient with the ritual, knowledgeable of what the ritual meant uh, as how to apply it to your life. Uh, and he was a shining example for me. Uh, unfortunately, he's still with us, and he he hasn't he has the opportunity now to lean on me, uh, and to and to remind me that he that he raised me <laughs> uh, masonically. So you know, that was that was my initial um, leadership example uh, of who I wanted to be, and that's why when I first came in, I didn't even know what the Grand Master was. I knew I wanted to be Worship Master, and I wanted to be like Cleveland Haynes. I have a great deal of respect for that brother. Great deal. Yes. For Master Wu. Well, this was really, really easy for me. Actually, the, the past master, when I was on the Junior War, and that one of someone else to, did not want me to go uh, to Junior Warden, he's the guy that really helped me progress. And the reason thing is because he took me under his wing. And he showed me how to bridge, bridge the gap between uh, the youth and the older, um, the older crowd. His name is Right Worship Mac Andrew, and he's a, a he was a big person inside the jurisdiction of New Jersey. He's one of those people. If you want to want to run for an office inside of the Grand Lodge, he was one of the ones you went to go speak to. And fortunately, he, he was out of my lodge. And he, he helped bridge that gap, which helped me get elected for people to believe in me uh, who may not have known me or either say, oh, this young guy, you know, and you know, he's so different. He's going to want to get in there and change everything. But right with the Mac Andrews actually spoke to them. And he helped me out quite a bit. Unfortunately, while I was Junior Grand Warden, he uh, had a heart attack and he passed. And I'll never forget, mm -hmm. I, was in, um, I was on my way to the hospital to go see him and I'm driving there and I got a call that he had passed. And then my whole thing was like, oh no, what am I gonna do now? <laughs> Who am I gonna go to when, when I'm in a pinch or I have questions or I need advice or leadership? Because believe me, grandmasters, we get advice. <laughs> Quite a, if we're smart, we listen to other people. 
And um, and these days, I keep them in my heart. And when I make a tough decision, I say, okay, you know what? What would Mac tell me to do? <laughs> so he's, he's with me. <laughs> with me. Wonderful, wonderful. Excellent. Um, so, brothers, um, what we're going to do now, we do have some questions um, from from our great audience. And um, please feel free to continue asking the questions so that we can pose them to our uh, both of the respective grandmasters. First question is, and, and we spoke a little bit about this tonight as well, um, how do you feel we can bridge the gap between younger and older members without older members thinking it's all about change and younger members thinking older members are holding on to seats and tradition? <laughs> <laughs> it's an ongoing struggle here. <laughs> uh, I think that's everywhere. <laughs> right. I, I, I don't know that there's, there's a clear answer. Uh, what we've been trying to do is to have informational series to where we can discuss uh, intelligently past practices and then pitch uh, proposals for a new way of doing business. And, and it's gone over pretty well for me thus far. Um, now, I will admit there have been some who've had to go kicking and screaming, but when we arrive at that destination together, you know, very often those more seasoned brothers have turned around and said, you know what, that was a good idea I gave you. You know, we can have a good laugh, uh, even though it wasn't their idea, but <laughs> we just try to work together. Uh, I mean, the goal of Freemasonry, um, as, as taught in our ritual, is that, that how can we best work and best agree? And oftentimes you have to listen to the leader and, and allow him to uh, execute his plans. And let's see what happens. It shouldn't be a contest of I told you so, but more so of how we can best work and agree and achieve our established goals. Um, dialogue is what I'm saying. Conversations, discussions, and not just doing and going forward without notifying the membership in advance because brothers don't like to be you know, forced to do something. They want to, they want to be part of the de decision-making process. I agree. I agree. Uh, dialogue is extremely important. You have to open the dialogue and talk about it. You can't jam things down brothers' throats. You, you can't do it. Uh, you'll get a lot of opposition if you do so. You try to, like I told you, the Millennial Committee, they meet directly with the grand habit. Matter of fact, we had one meeting and the grand matron and I had the millennial committee and some of those guys had, um, and young ladies had less than a year in the craft. They said, I can't believe I'm in a meeting with the grand master and the grand matron. And I explained to them, we need you. you are our future and we need to learn from you. Just like there's an older generation than myself and brother Stanley, we also have a younger generation where it's hard for us to communicate. So as a leader, I have to look at them with an open mind and listen. And sometimes you got to go out on a limb. Uh, just a, a small example. We put out a, uh, an Instagram account for the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge in Maryland. I mean, uh, New Jersey, my goodness. Did I say Maryland? <laughs> uh, New Jersey. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all right for me. I don't really understand why Instagram works, but that doesn't matter. I have faith in what the younger generation is telling me. They said, look, no one's, we aren't on Facebook. We are, Twitter's old. It's all about the color. So I listen and we put one out there and I contribute to it quite a bit. But that came from listening to them with blind faith because although I contribute to it, I still don't see why people are on Instagram as opposed to Right, right, right. But you know what's funny, Grandmaster? Uh, the fact that you said that you had faith in what they were telling you versus trying to use the power of your office to say, oh, y'all don't know what you're talking about. Let me get rid of y'all and put somebody in who's going to tell me what I want to hear. You know, I, 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 I applaud that um, because, you know, that's, that's something that I think that people forget about when you're in leadership, that it's not all about you. You put people in position to do their job and you have to have faith that they're doing their job to the best of their ability. You know, it's up to you to evaluate it, but you still have to have faith that they know what they're talking about at some point, for sure. Um, we got another question in here. Uh, or actually, your brother is thanking you all. He says that uh, 
You mean to tell me that I can't go from being newly raised straight to being a past grandmaster? Thank oh. <laughs> That, that that was Brother Jones down in Georgia. No, Brother Jones, you cannot go. You can't be just jump to be a past grandmaster. Trust me, I've tried. <laughs> yeah. uh, but on a serious note, we have we have another we have another question. Go ahead. I've heard of some honorary past grandmasters out there. So <laughs> technically, right. they, still, they still did something to be honored. <laughs> right. Uh, we, we got another question. This is actually one. Is this is actually? I think it's going to be a good one uh, from my good friend, uh, worthy matron uh, Danielle Anderson from down here in the District of Columbia. Uh, she says, uh, "How would both of you describe the relationship that exists between your grand lodges and your and your respective grand chapters of, of the uh, Order of Eastern Star?" Well, I, I start on this one. We have a great working relationship. I'm very, very blessed with the, grant, the uh, current administration here in uh, the jurisdiction of New Jersey. We, as I told you, we had a joint meeting with the millennials. You know, we discussed things. Like my grand matron and grand patron, they've come to me with different ide uh, ideas. They said, well, I know it's up to you. I said, no, we're gonna talk about this. Let us all make a decision. Just because, fortunately, just because you're grand master, doesn't mean you have to be the smartest person or the most knowledgeable person. You just have to know how to put the right people in the right positions. Right. So working with the grand matron and grand patron has been, it's, it's been a dream. It, it, it really has, I knew them before we all ascended into, into grand positions and I respect their opinion. We work together, we work together. Beautiful, Grandma Stanley. That's fantastic. Um, we have a unique situation here in Maryland. The the officers of the Grand Chapter actually go into office a couple of weeks before a new Grand Master is elected. Um, but that, that puts us in a, in a bit of a, a topsy-turvy mode here. So the Grand Worthy Matron will come in and she has her vision of how she wants things to be done. Uh, I, I'll say this, we, we have a great working relationship uh, she had to sit down and to learn what my vision was, which I could not fully express to her until I had been elected and installed. Uh, so since then, we've had an opportunity to speak. Uh, and in January, as a matter of fact, I met with all of the Masonic leadership here in Maryland, male and female, uh, to include the Shriners and daughters. Uh, and we had a great dialogue. So I would say uh, every every organization, Masonic, or shrine here in the state of Maryland is working in peace and harmony. Uh, we all we all respect one another in our various positions. Excellent. Uh, we have another question. I think you know what I've seen this question pop up from time to time, um, both in person and talking with folks and then online and on various social media as well. Uh, how do you all feel about memorizing versus reading the material during ritualistic work or in public? That's Damien Jack, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we, we, we practice our ABCs here, all books closed. Uh, so that's how I feel about it. <laughs> I'm old school in that regard. Hey, to, 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 get, to give you all some background on, on uh, my relationship with Grandmaster Stanley, when I met Grandmaster Stanley originally, he was a uh, grand lecturer. Yeah. So, right. so I already know what kind of brother he is when it comes to that time. Absolutely. Stuff. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, reading, reading out a book is just not an option. It's an embarrassment. Right. It's an embarrassment. It makes me cringe. We should learn our work. And some of us, are, are, are being a teacher, I understand some of us are, uh, learn a lot fa uh, faster than others. Then you find out what type of learner you are and get inside of that book. It's an absolute embarrassment. Mm, Hey, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> but but Danny and Jack, one of our previous guests, for sure, for sure. Uh, let's see. We got we got another we got another question coming in here. Uh, somebody said, "Oh, Worthy Matron Anderson said we don't play reading in D.C. here either." That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Uh, uh, we have we have uh, Jamar Murphy is asking. He said, "What is there that you believe that young brothers can and should be working on to develop themselves?" Uh, into being better leaders. Uh, I think you guys kind of covered that earlier, but is there anything else that you want to uh, mention before we uh, get ready to sign off? Yeah, I, 
I would say that in, in addition to what you can glean inside of a lodge or within the Masonic family, it's, there's nothing wrong with learning outside of it. I mean, there's many schools of thought. Uh, there are many books that can be consulted. Uh, you don't have to confine yourself to what's done or what's taught within your lodge or within your grand lodge. You know, explore other options. You know, look at other successful leaders, be they Masonic or otherwise, and try to emulate what they what they've done. I have a thing they should do. It helped me out quite a bit as a, a new master mason. And, and actually, as a as a new grand master, within the first few minutes, uh, first few months, is to travel. Once you you have the ability to defend yourself as a master mason, go to different jurisdictions in the state. And if you can travel with someone, go out of state, speak to other people. You can take some great ideas. A lot of things that I enforced when I got installed as grand master, I quote unquote borrowed from other grandmasters, from traveling to their jurisdiction or talking to them uh, or listening to a report at the conference of grandmasters. All right. So um, again, thank you, brothers. Um, it's, it's been a great, great conversation uh, tonight. I think between the questions that we bombarded you with um, and and just the, the light that you've been able to impart and the uh, also answer the questions from our guests has been great. Uh, now we're going to just go into closing thoughts. Anything that you want to leave uh, the audience with tonight? You know, any closing things, anything, any new things that may be happening in your jurisdiction that you want to advertise? You know, now would be a good time to do it. <laughs> we'll start with uh, uh, most worship brother Daoud. Okay, there's one thing that we're doing that I'm very, very excited about. It actually started with uh, most worship uh, Shelton J. Prescott, who is the immediate past Grand Master, is we, we partner with other organizations. And by doing that, it makes us stronger. For example, we have a, a, a coalition that we started in September from all of the hurricane, the hurricane relief. We got together with the Divine Nine. For those who don't, if you don't know, that is nine uh, African-American Greek letter organizations, uh, other fraternal organizations, and we did hurricane relief. And it greatly reduced our costs when we, we minimized, all, no, no, we shared the efforts. And we had hurricane relief in Houston, Texas, or Puerto Rico, and also the U.S. Virgin Islands. Two, we have the My Vote is Power coalition with the NAACP and the Urban League. And we've done some outstanding. That one actually started under the past Grandmaster Prescott, who was a previous guest on this program. Um, and we've had all different types of debates. And we have a, a debate coming up on May 24th in our Grand East at 5.30. And we're going to have the candidates for U.S. Congress and uh, US, U.S. Senate to have a forum. So that's it. Hmm. Thank you, that's brother. outstanding. That's outstanding. Uh, so my closing thoughts would be to to your audience. Uh, you you have two young grandmasters here. Uh, we have our own thoughts and ideas of how we want to lead our jurisdictions, but it is imperative for the membership of our respective jurisdictions, that's male, female, our youth organizations, to understand that the grandmaster cannot do it alone. The responsibility of the success or failure of the Prince Hall Masonic fraternity in whatever jurisdiction is the responsibility of every single member. If there's a plan in place, you must get behind it. You must support it. You can hash it out behind closed doors, but once a decision has been made, it must be 100%. Everyone must be behind the program. You cannot down talk it. You cannot. Uh, Overemphasize the importance of walking in lockstep with your grandmaster, your grandworthy matron, whoever it is that's in a position of leadership. It's everyone's responsibility to ensure a success once a decision has been made and a plan has been put forward. Secondly, I would say to those or to your audience is that we must take our masonry outside of our lodge rooms, outside of our OES chapters. We say we're taking good men and making them better. We have to find a way to better demonstrate it to the public. 
and private parties are good. They're good for raising money, but how do we demonstrate to our respective communities that we are actually here, alive and well, that we are relevant in all that we stand for if we don't take it outside of our meeting spaces? We have to live it. We have to live it. We have to exhibit it. I had a, a member tell me that he doesn't bring anyone into masonry because he loves masonry so much and he, he doesn't believe in, in certain things. I said, but you advertise it every day. I said, you got a you got a row of emblems from one end of your car to the next, but you don't want to talk to another person about Freemasonry. I said, and then you stand here and you tell me how much you love Freemasonry, but you are comfortable with your Freemasonry dying with you. You don't want to share with anyone else to ensure that this organization survives beyond you. And that's what I mean. We have to take Freemasonry out of our lodge rooms. We have to learn how to speak about the goodness of this organization. We have to tie it in. We have to hold our religious organization accountable because a lot of them don't understand the relationship between our particular brand of Freemasonry, Prince Hall, and our religious organizations. There is no black church without Prince Hall Freemasonry. And if you're not a Christian and you practice Islam, there's a connection there also that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. But we ought not allow the fraternity, especially Prince Hall, to be talked down by other members of our, of our community that look like us. They need to understand the connection and that's everyone's responsibility. If you're a member, you need to know your history. You need to understand the intimate connections. You need to be proud of who you are and you need to be able to explain it and to talk. You know, what do we do? You know, it can't be we do a fish fry so we can give out a $500 uh, a scholarship. That is important, but you we are so much bigger than that. We're so much bigger than that. So learn your history take on the full responsibility of what it means to be a member of this organization. Get involved. It's not just about flashing signs. That's all. That's the fun stuff. That's the fun stuff. But but be serious about what you do, because you wouldn't be able to practice it today if those that came before us were not serious, were not serious minded individuals and committed to all that we stand for. I can go on and on and on, but uh, I love this organization and I want to see it continue uh, we've been here 172 years in Maryland. I want to see us go three times that. Uh, and I wish I could live to see it grow and evolve uh, and change, but still be what it's supposed to be, a beacon of light to our communities. And before we close out also, I, I want to say again how grateful I am for having this opportunity uh, and having an opportunity even through this medium uh, to talk to, to three brothers who I have a great deal of love and respect for. So thank you again. Uh, and best wishes to you, Grandmaster Dawood. You know that I'm here in any capacity that, that the jurisdiction of Maryland or I personally can support you, we will do that. And I'm looking forward to coming to your testimonial. You oh. didn't advertise it, but it's coming up. I see all the tickets are sold, but you know, I'm sure there's still some souvenir journal ads we can get on. Somehow we can support you. Um, you're a dynamic young leader, and I, I want you to know that I look up to you. So keep doing what you're doing, because I'm watching you. Hey, and look, I, I I told you before. I'm just so excited uh, when you went in as Grand Macedonian. You for the, you know for the time that I've met you, and I can't wait to come down and visit Maryland. Believe me. And I put tickets to the side. You called your numbers in, so I, I have tickets. My ticket chair told me. I said, okay, that's in Maryland. You all right? We appreciate that. You you know we we was gonna be the gate crashes. We <laughs> if we couldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking forward to it, but I, I thank you. I thank you. And, uh, Brother Caffey and Brother Morgan, thank you so much. You've been gracious hosts. You've been real kind uh, as moderators. You could have asked us a, a great deal of more tough questions, uh, controversial questions. So I'm I'm just grateful that you were kind to, to the, the two of us. God bless you both. Thank you, brother. Uh, brother Morgan, parting shots. Well, you know, uh, what can I say? You know, I, I look up to I, I, honestly to all three of you uh, brothers. Um, you know, I, I'm very proud to say that um, one of the earliest um, Masonic accolades that I got outside of my my mother lodge was to be made an honorary member of Samson Lodge Number no. 66 in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, I, last year, one of the highlights of my of my uh, summer 
was being made an honorary member of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New Jersey. Uh, at that time, uh, I believe Grandmaster Prescott was still presiding, uh, but it was the same day that Grandmaster Dawood was elected. So we were actually there to, to, to witness that. And uh, wow. matter of fact, I think, uh, look, Grandmaster Dawood, I'm gonna sell you out just a little bit today. Uh, oh. Right before the right before election, they went into elections or whatever, Grandmaster Dawood was trying to borrow some gloves from, from, from your brother. <laughs> 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 That's a busy day, man. You got a lot of your brain. You right. can get the smoke. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But we made sure to get, that he had his gloves, though. We made sure. I, we made sure for, for for sure about that. Uh, you know, to Grandmaster Stanley, you know, I love lo love and respect for you, and and, and I want to thank you so much for allowing me to still be a member in D.C. Because uh, if it was not for a gentleman's agreement between D.C. and Maryland. Uh, mm -hmm. I might be a Maryland Mason, so I, mm -hmm. I got a lot of love and respect for you, for, for you as well, sir, and you know that already. Um, to, our, to our audience, again, uh, we, we want to thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I think the main message that I got from both of these grandmasters is regardless of your age or your level of experience, engage with your leadership. They, they, mm -hmm. they know that they don't have all the answers, but by working together, we can support them and they will better be able to support us. Make sure that you engage them. Don't be scared to disagree, but disagree without being disagreeable. And, uh, and and sometimes we have to learn to meet them in the middle. And you only get to do that by taking the opportunities to talk to them and uh, and let them know what you're thinking about. And 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 good leaders like like these brothers here will value that information. And you never know; you might even get them to change their mind every now and again if you have something that makes a little bit more sense than the direction that they were going in. So make sure that you engage with your leadership. Um, with that being said, uh, brother Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you. No, thank you. And thank you, brothers, uh, once again, uh, for the great conversation tonight. Thank you to our viewers for the great questions and uh, comments that you've made. You know, within our fraternal organizations, dynamic leadership is imperative. In order to move our historic organization forward, we need brothers that understand the significance of their leadership and who are willing to just truly not rest on what you know, we've accomplished in the past. And I think that was illustrated by our two respective grandmasters tonight. I'd like to personally, again, thank these two esteemed brothers for not only being guests on our show, but moving the craft forward in their respective jurisdictions. Hopefully this video, and that's one reason why we wanted to continue to do it on YouTube. So not just for this generation, but generations down the road, they can refer back to it. And I think this will be an episode when when brothers ask me personally, you know, what can I do to prepare myself or I want to be worship master one day or one day I aspire to be uh, preside in the Grand East. This is a video that I'm going to point them to uh, because the information that you two good brothers gave tonight was just outstanding. So, again, thank you for that uh, to our audience. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you've gained a little insight and we hope that you join us for future broadcasts of the Prince Hall Think Tank. Have a good evening and remember. Let's teach masonry in our lodges. Good, night, Good evening.